Good Friday afternoon. I'm Anna Palmer, co author of the Political Playbook and editorial director of Politico's Women Rule Platform. I'm thrilled to be leading a conversation about sustainable good and making modern food systems resilient, nourishing, and equitable this afternoon. Given all the questions about the state of the U.S. supply chain and food waste happening around the country in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, I can't think of a better time to be having this conversation. This afternoon, I'm joined by a delegate from the Maryland General Assembly, Leslie Silverglide, co-founder and CEO of the fast casual restaurant Mixed, and Catherine Quaid, communications and outreach coordinator at the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's get started. Leslie, I'd like to start with you. You're on the front lines right now in terms of supply chain and having to rethink your strategy for getting customers food. What have you done in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic? Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly have changed the way we operate significantly. So um, we have moved to takeout delivery only and um, have really amplified those efforts. We've also been very focused on helping people in need. So this has impacted people so quickly and so many people have lost their jobs. So we've been providing free meals to anybody that needs them, um, along with providing free meals to um, healthcare workers and have partnered with hospitals throughout the areas where we're located. I want to ask, uh, there's a talk now about kind of issues with supply chain and pork not being in supermarkets in the next few days. And, and are you concerned about kind of the supply chain in general? I, I know that's something that you've got to, you've, you've worked on in terms of doing local, local food as well. Yeah. I mean, from a supply chain perspective, we're not that nervous, um, honestly, because most of our producers are very focused on producing for restaurants. And so really we're looking to buy as much as we can from our farmers because as so many restaurants have shut down, um, they're having extra. And so we're even doing um, CSA boxes now in our restaurants as well. And so we've partnered with a company called Sonoma Feed that's a cooperative of 80 local farmers where our customers can um, sign up for their subscription boxes and, and get access to fresh local produce. So we're just kind of trying to think outside the box how we can not only help our customers, help people in need, but also really focus on our suppliers and our growers um, so they continue to have business as well. Laura, I wanted to turn to you next. You're a delegate in the Maryland General Assembly. You kind of come at this from a different perspective. That is the legislator. In your first session in Annapolis in 2019, you sponsored successful legislation to establish a process for ensuring consideration of Maryland farmers and state food contracts, and also to support local food hubs to facilitate direct distribution of local farmers' products to institutions. How important is this go local approach when you kind of are facing a pandemic like COVID-19? Sure, well, I think, you know, what we have been saying all along um, now for years is that we need to have a strong and sustainable local food system for a number of reasons. And some of it is about um, equity and access to healthy food. And a lot of our policies have really built that piece of it. Some of it is about um, environmental sustainability. It's not sustainable to be trucking uh, food thousands of miles back and forth across the country. A lot of it's about economic opportunity. Um, and then, of course, we always talk about the importance of community resilience and why we need a strong local food system for community resilience. And tragically, that's sort of all of it is on display, the inequities in our food system, the inequities in, in access to food, um, the challenges with uh, supply chains that require um, massive movement back and forth across the country. And, um, and of course, there's this broader environmental um, aspect to this where we're seeing that these general issues around um, the social determinants of health, both in terms of people who live um, in more frontline communities as well as people who don't have access to healthy food. And we're seeing that those who um, generally are more vulnerable are also more vulnerable to this virus, as would be expected. And so these are issues we've worked on for years. And so now we see them sort of playing out. And it's important, I think, right now, you know, the work I'm doing in this moment is sort of making sure 
farmers markets can keep functioning and making sure SNAP is uh, functioning at the farmers markets and folks using SNAP can do online delivery and we're connecting and supporting farmers to do the direct to consumer work. Um, but even while we're doing that, I think it's really important, you know, we, we um, hope we don't see anything like this again, but the reality is that when we have this crisis, we need to also start building towards um, the kind of world we want to live in, but also building so that the next crisis doesn't look like this one. And so, um, so really making sure that even while we're um, looking at the things that are working now, are working because they are these community connections around food systems. Um, and so, and I think Leslie just, just gave an example of one of those. And so it's really important that we're highlighting these broader policy issues, even while we're working on responding to the immediate needs um, so that we can, we can be addressing both simultaneously. In terms of that, are there things that you're already starting to see that maybe you think needs the, the legislator needs to look at or best practices, any kind of one or two things that you think government needs to be doing now, looking forward to that potential for another pandemic or another uh, kind of crisis like this? Well, so so immediately right now, we need to make sure that farmers can get to, to market. So that's about making sure that the farmers markets are functional. Like I was um, really disappointed to hear that some states have actually shut down their farmers markets. Farmers markets are a crucial piece of this, this broader structure and making sure that at those markets, especially markets that are in food deserts, um, that SNAP is functioning, that SNAP is being doubled, federal nutrition benefits are being doubled, that um, that federal nutrition benefits are being accepted at, at farm stands. That Again, that, that both the, the direct to consumer pieces and then the equity pieces within that. I think that's sort of top priority right now. Um, and then I think um, really the, all of the, the, the supply chain issues, I think, you know, are, are we've been looking at for, for a number of years and um, uh, issues around um, food processing, uh, aggregation and distribution, supporting multiple small farmers to be able to provide the food to our institutions, both state institutions as well as private institutions. That's something we had really just started to work on. We passed some great legislation this year on that. I'm very proud of that. Um, but we're seeing how much that's needed now um, as uh, as folks are, especially in the in the, the larger supply chains and the larger systems are really struggling. Um, and and ha having those uh, aggregation and distribution systems for multiple small farmers is crucial in that process. Uh, Catherine, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, you're an indigenous person from Oregon who's using your voice to raise awareness around the protection of first foods and indigenous lands from the impacts of climate change. What do you see the role now of the, this effort on climate activism for the sustainable mo uh, movement? Yes, thanks, Anna, for that question. Um, yes, I'm calling in um, from the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute lands here in Central Oregon, where my ancestors are from. And um, yeah, this um, role of first foods and indigenous rights is, I think, central to sustainability because we are the original stewards of these lands. We have been living in um, reciprocity with the earth for millennia. And so um, I do think that there are lessons to be learned and um, traditional ecological knowledge to be shared from how we um, create sustainable systems and how we replicate that relationship that we have with the earth um, within policy making decisions, within institutions, um, to really ensure that these new systems forward um, are sustainable and are respecting indigenous sovereignty and are not contributing further to um, climate change and to climate destruction, which we have seen how um, our current um, kind of monocultures and, you know, huge CAFO farms um, have been destroying um, areas all around the world, you know, thinking about the Amazon um, where soy and um, space for um, cows to um, graze, grazing areas have destroyed um, essentially the lungs of the planet and have caused people to intentionally set them on fire. So these are issues um, that we need to start um, tying together and connecting to ensure that any systems moving forward um, also carry a justice component and a lens, uh, an Indigenous perspective. 
I want to follow up on that, kind of zoom out a little bit. Um, you know, I think one of the these kind of big challenges and a crisis like this, there's, there can be some advances and challenges you're seeing uh, on longer term, the context of climate change and, and food awareness and equity issues. I just would be interested, you know, are there one or two things that you're focused on trying to make sure that even though we're in this kind of you know, international crisis that are that are still top of mind that people should be thinking about. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I, it's hard to boil it down to two things um, right now because I think there are so many um, different <laughs> issue areas that we can kind of discuss. But I think in terms of climate change, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of climate change and equity, really um, considering that the people who are most vulnerable right now to the health pandemic are also most vulnerable to climate disaster and climate chaos, um, and that these root causes of both of these of both of these um, pandemics and crises are the same, um, and we can trace that back to um, capitalism, how our economics are structured, who's um, labor is valued, which communities are valued, how do we access medical resources, um, who's living in food deserts. And so I think if we're talking about that top line issue, um, really recognizing um, these systems that don't serve us, right? They don't serve us in a health pandemic. I think um, one of the panelists was discussing, you know, that we're seeing that actually these local community networks are what is resilient and that these larger institutions aren't helping us right now. I live in a rural indigenous small community um, and our first foods are what is helping us get by right now. Our um, commitment to each other is what is helping us get by right now. Um, these $1,200 stimulus checks aren't lasting long, right? Um, so I think considering what these overarching systems are and how they're being replicated in our everyday life and in the systems and institutions that we work in and working to dismantle those um, will, I think, ultimately create a more resilient um, community structure, both at the personal, interpersonal community, national level, um, and also set us up for a sustainable future. Well, we are we are short on time, so I actually want to do a rapid fire question to each of you. I always think it's important in these kinds of conversations to give something kind of empowering or or, or a, an action item for the people that are watching this. So I'd love, and Leslie, we'll start with you. I'd love to ask you, what's the best case scenario on the horizon for getting us to a sustainable food system, and what is one thing that people who are watching this can do to help? Um, further that, make it happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the encouraging things that we're seeing that's happening because of the pandemic is that people are making more of a connection with what they're eating, um, whether or not that's just because they've had to turn their life upside down and um, go back to cooking in the kitchen and really thinking about ingredients and where they're coming from, seasonal eating. Um, I'm just seeing this heightened awareness in general around food and how it is something that really brings people together. It makes people happy. There's such a strong connection. Um, and so, you know, I think that will ultimately bring people away from more processed food, get them eating with the seasons, thinking about where they're shopping. So I think for me, that's the biggest takeaway of this and where I think there's the most hope is that people are reinvigorated to really care about where their food comes from and really following that entire chain and thinking about who you're supporting and that every dollar you spend, you're essentially voting with that dollar. And so using that mentality in what you're putting into your body and for your family, I think will ultimately make a really big difference in the world. Laura, how about you in terms of what are you seeing in Maryland? Are there things that you you are hoping that will be the takeaway for the future for the people who are going through this? Sure, yeah. So as I said, I think that um, the the uh, we're having this opportunity to have these conversations right now. And so 
when people who are used to a relatively decent amount of privilege, who usually are used to going to the grocery store and getting what they need and now are shifting to purchasing their food, uh, maybe by, by delivery, um, I think a really important thing to do is to ask um, what is happening to folks who can't count on that? What is happening to folks who can't go into the grocery store? What is happening right now? We're working on making sure that people who, um, you know, again, I'm just going to come back to the SNAP benefits and, and how people can use them. We're working on this question about how can we get it, get it so folks who use SNAP benefits can also do online purchases and get deliveries, whether from farmers or from uh, grocery grocery stores. So I think it's really important as people are sort of adjusting their lives and everyone is people with a great deal of privilege are adjusting a little bit and people who are always suffering and struggling are, are adjusting even more. Um, and so I think for folks who, who have a decent amount of privilege, it's worth thinking about um, really what this means and what, what getting access to food looks like every day for um, for people who are, who are uh, closer to the financial edge. Um, it's a good time to ask those questions. Um, and then to ask even the bigger questions about what is this uh, connection between how I get my food and the impact that that has on the broader environment, sort of to the, the earlier comments that were made, um, the rainforests and the diesel trucking across the, the country? Um, and then could I build a relationship with at least one farmer? Can I build a relationship with at least one person who's growing my food and start to understand where that's coming from? Because I think when we start to make those connections, it helps kind of make sure we're doing the broader advocacy work that we need um, uh, to, to make sure we're building the bigger systems that really ultimately are going to serve everybody in our community in an equitable and just way and in a way that's sustainable for our planet. Catherine, how about you? What, what is your kind of, if you could have an action item for the people that are watching this from where your, your vantage point is, what would you like to say to them? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think kind of an action item is, um, yeah, I, I think this there is space and um, opportunity to start drawing those connections and start um, considering how what works and what doesn't work. And an action item is to literally get involved, care, you know, whatever you care about. Um, is it gardening? Is it permaculture? Is it, um, you know, and ensuring SNAP benefits at farmers markets, um, mobilizing and advocating for that at every single level of um, our policy making, whether that's at the Chamber of Commerce or you know calling um, your local representative. I think um, just getting out there, voting, um, saying what you want and what you think we need to build these resilient communities and start having those dialogues, um, as well as supporting um, indigenous peoples all around the world who are already doing this work and who are also incredibly vulnerable to um, COVID-19 right now. All right, well, unfortunately we are uh, running quickly out of time, but I do wanna thank uh, all three of you for joining us. I think we found some good tips in terms of eating locally, in terms of getting involved in meeting and, and knowing where your food's coming from and kind of thinking about the benefits as well as really getting involved in your community and finding a way to, to find your voice. So I wanna thank all three of you for lending your voice and experience to this conversation. And I also wanna thank those of you who tuned in. We appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at A Palmer DC. Stay safe and have a great weekend.